without any further ado, I'm going to move to our to our first speaker. Welcome, Irene Petrick. Um, Dr. Irene Petrick is the Senior Director of Industrial Innovation Internet of Things Group at Intel. Intel being our most recent Platinum member, actually. So we were delighted to have Intel join at that level uh, in April this year. Irene joined Intel in 2015 and focuses on emerging technology, social and global trends, and their combined impact on the industrial space. Her work highlights the industrial Internet of Things, edge computing, the transition to intelligent manufacturing, and the needs of the future workforce. 3D printing and distributed manufacturing and the new business models that are enabled by intelligent manufacturing. A long list of uh, things you're involved in there, Irene. Um, yeah. Today, Irene will look at what it takes to drive and scale a project in the Internet of Things space. So a warm welcome from, virtual welcome from the open group to uh, Irene Patrick. Over to you. Thanks. Um, so today I'm going to share with you, and I've left lots of time for questions. And if you have questions as I'm speaking, please interrupt. I'd love to have this be a discussion rather than a, a formal presentation, talk at them kind of a thing. So what I want to talk to you today about is the, the challenges with really standing up projects. Uh, we call it projects at the edge of understanding. So, so when I take AI and when I combine it with IoT technologies, what does that really mean for standing up a project for really um, making, having it be successful and then having it be able to scale. So what I'm going to share with you today is a lot of work that we've done over the last couple of years uh, with over 400 participants. Um, so this is, it's not my opinion specifically, it's not Intel's opinion, it's really practitioners who are technologists in manufacturing companies and the technologists in ecosystem companies that support them. Um, in the effort to be brief and pithy, I've uh, tried to make a, a, a lot of this very uh, specific, but I put material in the backup. So if there are things that interest you, there is additional material in the backup if you, if you wanted some of the details. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things. First of all, we did two years of study, my, faith, my colleague Faith McCrary and I, um, of over 400 people. Uh, we call it... Uh, thinking in the wild, so to speak. In phase one, we really looked at what the industry, what, what was happening in factories, what was going on within the factory walls, uh, but also thinking from the factory floor to the C-suite in terms of factory operations. And what we found in that study in 2018 is that it really was the co-evolution of workers and manufacturing operations. When we looked at that, we said, well, that's great to know, but how can we, as a technology company, how can we better understand what strategies and tactics actually help us accelerate these smart projects? Um, and, and that's sort of what we refer to as the AI plus IoT projects. We, we just call them smart projects uh, to, to make it easier. So we, we have a series of, of six different, seven different uh, reports that are out. Uh, all of which, or all but one of which is available publicly. Um, so if you're interested in the backup, there is additional information about those reports. But today I'm going to focus on what are the challenges of taking these smart projects and, and, and what is it from the technologist's point of view. And I have a, a graphic in the back that talks about who those technologists are and why they matter and what kind of backgrounds they have. But right now, what I want to do is really focus on what I'll call the smart project mindset. And, and the smart project mindsets are important to understand uh, because they really uh, emphasize um, who's the expert innovator, who's the innovation maker, what about the production person, what about the process watcher. And to really understand how to stand up these projects, we have to understand the kinds of people who are participating in them. The, the, the expert learner is, is really all about uh, uh, smart innovation and ideas around manufacturing. This person, this expert learner on the left, is probably the most seasoned uh, person that you would see. Um, and this person is somebody who teaches him or herself as they go and is, is always looking for uh, new ideas and new ways of doing things. These people become very important on teams. Uh, however, we also have to think about the fact that these people uh, can sometimes get ahead of their technologies. The, the innovation maker 
uh, really is um, much more around uh, uh, I'm the deep person uh, who wants to try new ideas, uh, and I really want to have, I've got too much chat going on here. Um, I really want to have a, a better sense of, of, of the production. I want to have a better sense of the manufacturing, and I want to understand how to make it, uh, how to improve those processes. The production champion really is the person who understands uh, the production environment very, very deeply. We would call this the OT expert. And then you've got those process washers over there on the right-hand side. And those process watchers really are a little bit more conservative than the other three mindsets. And those process watchers are um, working, looking for where is risk going to be introduced into my process? How can I make this robust? How can I not bring down the rest of the factory or the rest of the line as I implement this? So you can see that all four of those mindsets uh, become very important at different stages of these smart projects. So what do we know about the projects and about the challenges? Well, on the left-hand side, and this actually surprised my colleague Faith and I, when we look at the recent project types, much more of them are in production than we anticipated. Almost 61% of them are in production. We, I'm gonna to come to this point in a moment, but we think that a lot of those production projects that people described to us last year in our study really has to do with some of the low-hanging fruit that I could implement on an existing machine. Um, you can see, however, that there's a large percentage of pilot prototype and proof of concept projects um, that are being done that are really pushing the envelope more than those that are in production right now. And, and I'll, I'll call to mind there were 193 technologists that were responding to this. So we're not talking about a, a small sample. And those technologists are spread across a wide variety of industries and a wide variety of uh, roles and companies. Interestingly, the areas of biggest challenge that, that technologists told us, when we talk about the different areas of a, a project, it turns out that the biggest challenges are coming as deployment and, mint and maintain, maintenance comes up. And we think this is really important because most of the technology companies are really focused on how do I define the program, the project, how do I architect it, how do I develop it and develop the tools to support it. And then we sort of say, okay, we're done. Now manufacturers go and deploy it. And we think that that's a really serious problem because the majority of problems are happening at the deployment level and at the maintenance level, the, the sustainability aspect. And, and the reason for this, we think, is captured in that far right graph, the expertise versus the responsibilities. We're really seeing people trying to deploy smart projects where their expertise far exceeds, I mean, far underperforms what they need to do. So for example, when you get down to things like real time, or when you get down to things like uh, computer vision, you can see the experience, the people who have experience uh, in the buff color um, are far fewer than those who are actually responsible to deploy it. And we think this is a serious issue. Certainly my own teams are now looking at the kind of developer toolkits that we need to be producing and the kinds of supporting materials we need to be making available. But we think that the ecosystem in general needs to be much more aware of what we call the unanticipated developer whose expertise doesn't quite keep pace with the responsibilities that that developer or deployer is responsible for. So this one is actually related to what I was talking about earlier. When we polled these 190 some technologists, less than 50% said they thought their smart project of today had a 50% shot of making it to production. And we think this is a stunning number. It might not surprise many of you, however, because we see pilot purgatory, but, but we have to then say, well, what causes pilot purgatory? Why is it so difficult to go from project at the pilot scale to actual scale and then long-term sustainability? And what we're finding, what technologists told us, is the problem is that it's not a single problem. It's really a holistic problem. 
In other words, I have to be thinking about people, processes, organization, culture, and organization structure, and the technologies. And each one of those in and of itself has its own problems. But when you put them all together in these smart projects, we find that it becomes really challenging. And when, I, when we think about on the right-hand side, the top factors that people told us were driving this complexity. Not surprising, the majority said operational technology is a real serious problem. My company and my processes are different than other companies in different sectors. We're all dealing with legacy systems, but look at how far up people come. People become a difficult challenge because they have a skill set, a skill set, a lack of skill sets. They don't have a statistical mindset or a data-driven mindset. And then you think about enterprise systems. Well, enterprise systems have been around for a long time. The problem is that smart technologies, when we start thinking about these projects, we don't necessarily think all the other systems they have to touch. And so our, our, our respondents told us it's really a system of systems approach. And to get to sustainability, I have to be looking at, at the outset, I have to be planning for all of the systems that my smart project is going to touch or rely on to actually provide insights. And because of that, uh, participants told us, technologists said we need a clear roadmap to go from pilot or POC to scale. Once we have that clear vision of what digital technologies can do for our company, then we can begin to work incrementally. And this becomes really important because you'll often hear fail fast. You often hear start, start small, fail fast. Uh, we believe it's think big and then start small, fail fast, learn quickly. So it's a little bit different, but if you don't have a real appreciation for where you think digital technologies can make a difference, then everything looks like progress until it doesn't connect. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, this really means that uncertainty is the new normal. And I'll indicate you're going to see quotes of several different times here in this presentation. These are all quotes from technologists directly. Uh, if we've made any kinds of additions, you see it in little carrots. Uh, so these are their verbatim words. And this person, uh, this program engineer, uh, in, in actually an operating technologist uh, uh, in a manufacturing environment says the biggest challenge is uncertainty in the technologies. They just keep advancing and we need consistency. So what they're basically saying is there's a mismatch between what ecosystem partners are giving us and what manufacturing technologists can actually consume. So 55% of the technologists said, uh, we're, we're wondering, how was the technology going to integrate and scale in their target environment? And do we have the best mix of this technology for their purpose? Uh, would, a pro, would a project deliver real benefit in the long run? And this one becomes really critical because often we think about smart projects uh, and their point value when we think about ROI. We don't think about how to re-envision the process. So we, we calculate, we tend to calculate ROI in very, what I'll call myopic uh, uh, terms. And, and, and that's a serious problem. And technologists themselves recognize if I can't describe business value, I'm unlikely to get my project funded. And then the last one is what resources are really going to be needed and what will the workflow look like? And this is an interesting one because IoT projects span um, a lot more uh, uh, traditional functional responsibilities than a more traditional upgrade would. And so what we see is technologists working with people who are out of their functional silos, who are out of their general work stream and workflow of people they collaborate with. And so you've got a lot of relationship building that has to happen at the outset to really think about all the places this technology might touch uh, the, the, the operations. Because of that, so, so smart projects really are a different breed. They, they really, the, the technologist said, smart technologies may be thoroughly described. And, and I would question that because we're not hearing a lot about thoroughly described smart technologies. Um, but what isn't described, what people really care about is what's their interaction with other technologies. Um, and this person links it to, a, it's like a pharmaceutical, which is well described, but which can have unexpected consequences when combined with other pharmaceuticals. 
And we're hearing this is one of the biggest challenges to successfully going from pilot or POC to scale. And that is I didn't anticipate all of the other changes that would be necessary to truly achieve the ROI that was predicted, uh, often by vendors, by the way. I didn't really think about, gee, what will I need to have as, as, as databases that will have to interact? What will I have to have as bandwidth? If I have constrained bandwidth, how will I have to think about computing at the edge versus sending all my data to a cloud? If I have constrained bandwidth, how do I identify which data really matters versus which is sort of interesting to have? And so the biggest challenge that we're seeing uh, frequently for projects that don't go to scale is that we didn't think carefully enough about the infrastructure needs underlying that technology, that smart technology. So the smart project, even when it's successful, often doesn't yield the ROI we want to see. So here's a, a, what we call the eyeball, um, but this really captures, we asked technologists to tell us what was their primary responsibility in terms of technologies that they were using on these smart projects, and then to tell us what other secondary technology were they required to know to be able to deploy that smart project. So the way to read this is the larger the dot around the circumference, the more common that was called out as a primary responsibility by technologists. The lines between them indicate the amount of time that particular technology was paired with another. And what you can see here, and we took out all of the secondary relationships. These are only the primaries. When we had the secondary relationships in there, it was a black circle. And what this really calls to mind is that solutions aren't a single technology. Smart, techno smart projects require combinations of technologies and frequently combinations of vendors. And this becomes really problematic for a manufacturer trying to stand up a smart project when managing those vendors, finding those vendors, is often a really out of their comfort zone. So, so these technologies come from multiple vendors and the legacy systems and the infrastructure in which these processes sit didn't anticipate all of these interdependencies. So it's not just that I have a legacy system or a legacy piece of equipment, or that I have constrained infrastructure resources, it's that I haven't even thought about all of the places these smart projects will touch. So this is one that, that came very clear, and these are, once again, these are technologists telling this. This isn't purchasing, this isn't a, a senior leadership CEO level, this is the technologists themselves. And, and we basically are finding that the vendor relationship, which has driven most of our, our, our interactions, has really been a transaction. It's been a handoff of goods and services for a particular fee under a particular contract during a particular time. What we're finding with smart projects is that that's a recipe for disaster. It really is much more about building a relationship with the partner who can share goals, who understands the vision, who has a clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish as the manufacturer, and who has a, a, a commitment to helping you see this through. So it's not just a set it and leave it and, and good luck. It really has to be much more of a partnership. And what we're hearing from technologists, those projects that were the most successful really had an ongoing partnership management approach where they worked with vendors and they work with them over time. So at different phases of a project, you might have different needs from a vendor and your vendor has to be as committed to that project as you are. And understanding that upfront and building that into your contract language becomes really important. And then you have to, this is, this is one that's getting companies into trouble right now, manufacturing companies. Um, we have to be balancing our external sourcing to stand up smart projects with our internal resources to grow bench strength. One of the things technologists have told us is that my company is so worried about being late to the party or missing out that they're bringing in external consultants, they're bringing in external experts to stand up these smart projects. And gee, I, as the expert in my company, am less doing the grunt work. 
And so I'm doing boring projects and I'm not learning how to stand these smart projects up. And so we, we think that companies need to be aware of this, 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 um, this, this tension because getting things done quickly doesn't always get things done in a sustainable way. So here's another one when, when we think about the, the role of vendors and the interaction between vendors and, and uh, manufacturers. Here's a, a, a consultant, uh, a strategist from a consultancy saying, I think the biggest single request I would have is that documentation and literature improve. And what do people really want? Well, they want to get out of the marketing hype. They want to get out of the jargon. They want to get past high level two paragraph descriptions of their uh, projects to much deeper pilot descriptions. So I want, to, I want to hear not just success stories that are at a very high level, I want to hear what didn't work. So people want easy to understand, actionable, up-to-date content and messaging. And, and this, these, these things are, are things I think you can use as a way to say, is my vendor, do I have the right vendors? Is my vendor really being as, um, as let's see, as, as responsive to me as possible? Um, so content that bridges technical silos also becomes very important. Remember I said earlier that I have content, I mean, I have uh, people working on smart projects, but often these are, are creating teams that are outside of my normal working groups. So I have to have content that helps bridge some of those technical silos. It has to be much more detailed with better examples and tutorials, with real world examples. And then the other two things that are, are important is companies, technologists have told us that forums are very important when they think about where to go for information. They're really not thinking about, I'm gonna go to my vendor's website and I'm gonna read all their marketing materials. They, they really want interactive peer-based communities such as open group, uh, to provide them with the ability to, to be interlinked, to have discussions where you can actually sort of discuss both the pros and the cons, the positives and the negatives. And you can do it in bite-sized chunks so I can get material just in time when I'm ready to consume it. And, and I think that technology companies have done a pretty poor job of this overall, my own included, by the way. So here's another piece of it that's, that's very important to standing up smart projects, um, and that's the complexity takes engagement, not just buy-in. We hear about buy-in all the time, but it's not, that's not enough. And in fact, I'm working with a very large company right now, uh, helping them think about their digitization strategy um, and, and taking some of the work we've done and saying, how could we roll this out for our own company? And, and what they're finding is, People, even when they have an appetite to change, are fearful of some of that change and, and really want a chance to work much more at the beginning when strategies are being talked about and discussed than they want to have strategies imposed on them. So what are people asking for? Well, first of all, to get engagement, you have to pre provide context. I really have to understand what groups need to interact and then I have to be able to tell those groups why they need to interact. I have to find a much more collaborative approach that brings these teams together and that creates a set of stakeholders that share a common vision, that share a, a common mission. And often those stakeholders are in a, what we call a tribe. They're in a much less formalized group than we're typically used to working in. And then finally, we found that the best projects really focus on the why of projects to bring others along. In other words, why am I undertaking this? What value will it have? Why do I think that you as a particular line worker or technologist should become involved in this? How will you benefit? How will our company benefit? So we really have to get past the, we can do this three times faster. Or we, if we introduce this particular type of compute, uh, we can process things more quickly. That really is considered behind the scenes. I really don't care if I'm the manufacturer. I really don't care 
if I can do it two times faster or 2.2 times faster or three times faster, what I care about is what results I can get more quickly and how those results lead to business value. And so we have to change the way the conversation is and we have to do it very early and we have to do it continuously over time. So it's not a one and done here either. Often, in fact, this was true of the very big company we're working with, uh, heavy manufacturer, they had change management plans, but those change management plans didn't happen until after they were down the pike of, of saying, here's what we're going to do, and oh, line workers, here's what we're going to provide to you. And what they found is that those change management plans were inadequate to really create the engagement necessary to accelerate the adoption. So what really sets successful projects apart? is the ability of the early project team to ask the right questions at the start of the project. And I have a list of questions that people told us were the most important things to address at the beginning of the project. At the, in the backup, in the interest of time, I didn't put it into the main presentation, but I think it's worth a really careful look because many of these questions are what are we trying to accomplish? So they'll start with the technology. They start with what are we trying to accomplish? Why does this bring business value to it? How, to whom does this bring business value? So who are the first kinds of stakeholders should we engage? Only then do we start talking about what possible technology alternatives might help us, who are the vendors we might go after, and why? And then how are we gonna build relationships with those vendors? So that this smart project isn't a standalone island in our manufacturing plant that we can actually figure out how it links over time to other kinds of uh, projects. So I'll leave, this is the last slide that I have is as part of the major, main presentation because I wanted to leave time for questions. So I wanted to leave some takeaways. So if you are a technologist, either within the uh, manufacturing operation or in an ecosystem company vendor that supports them, there's some things we've found that are really uh, uh, differentiating between those that are very successful and those that are less successful. And the first one is you have to be able to move quickly without falling into that schedule trap of, oh my gosh, I can't get behind schedule. Early on, projects tend to be a bit behind schedule because people had over, uh, over rose the expectations of what was possible. You need to focus on the problem and you need to be able to figure out how you're going to measure that value. And you need to think about how you can do that in a minimum viable approach. You can always add on bells and whistles over time as you become more comfortable with the base solution. It's much more difficult to take a very complex solution and deploy it in a way that you can achieve all of that value upfront. We've not seen that happen very, very successfully by too many companies. You need to aim not just for buy-in, but the engagement that I was talking about. And you need to find and nurture a tribe. And, and what is a tribe? A tribe is a group of people who come together with a common mission. They often organize in less formal ways, so they're not necessarily all answering to the same functional silo. They're often not all of the same pedigree or background or experience. And this tribe comes together because they have a belief that this smart project can really make a difference. You need to nurture that tribe because that's the group that actually creates the, the bridgers, the, the barrier spanners over time. And you need to think about not just who's leading the initiative, but who's gonna influence it? And how do I bring those influencers on early so that they can become engaged and influenced the rest of their colleagues who need to be bought into this over time. You need to cultivate what we call connection bridgers. And once again, I've got very deep descriptions of these in the backup, but the connection bridgers are really the people who bring an interesting view, but they also bring a view over time, across functions, and often across organizations. And, and we have heard uh, from technologists, particularly vendor technologists, that understanding who the connection bridgers are is critical to, a, to accelerating successful deployment of smart projects. 
And then finally, you need to embrace what we call connection independence. These are the people who are skeptical, who bring a skeptical point of view, and who question things in a way that moves the project forward because we've considered things that might not work at the beginning. So if I have a very rosy view of the project, I tend to miss where I might stumble. These independents actually help uh, in creating uh, a lot of the uh, upfront planning and upfront discussion that we've heard is so important to these successful projects. So with that, I, I will open this up to, to discussions and, and hope uh, we can have a, 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 an open discussion. So how would you best like to organize this discussion? Irene, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was a, a great job. We had lots of comments in the chat and the Q&A saying yeah, I couldn't that. unfortunately pay attention to the man present, so I missed a lot of those comments. No, well, that, and that's fine because um, the, way, the way we're going to do it is um, the, the Q&A channel has been used, so I've, got a, I've been keeping a collection of uh, or adding to okay. a collection of comments for you. So I'm afraid it's, it's just you and me, but the, the comments are from all over the place. So um, I'll do my best. And even though you've allowed us uh, a plenty of time, I'm not sure we'll get to all of them. But, uh, okay. but before... Steve, just a minute. Somebody has asked, can I put up the questions while I answer questions? So let me go to those. Questions. There's the questions. Okay. Yes. Right. So um, yes. Yeah, so that's that's those. But, but before I finish, thank you very much for your for your thoughts and uh, and your presentation today. A very interesting. Lots of people saying there's so much information here. Just to repeat, all the slides will be available to everyone who's uh, who's here today and has registered um, uh, during the course of next week, probably Wednesday we, next week. We also have a report. Uh, behind this, it's, I don't know, 60 or 70 pages that companies are welcome to request, and I will be happy to send out. That's great. That's great to, uh, sure. great to know. So let's go straight into the question. The first, yeah. one, uh, first one that came in is, um, do you see a gap or a disconnect between a technology expert and an industry domain expert? And if so, how do you close that gap? Oh, yeah, that's the, well, in smart projects, that's the ITOT divide that we always talk about. Right. Because most of these smart projects require not just understanding a deep understanding of the process, but understanding how information technologies can support changes to that process, but also some of the vulnerabilities that information technologies introduce. So you have to have the security, and you have to have thought about it up front. You have to understand the um, the linkage between different databases. We're finding that even simple things like, I have the wrong labels. We call things differently across functions. And so you need to have a lot of those discussions up front so that you're bringing these different groups together who are going to use the smart technology and they're having discussions. Uh, I'll, I'll use a very specific example from this large company we're working with. Um, they found that even when they talked about inventory, uh, they were we talking about gross or net. Where we talk. So there are just little things that don't sound like hard problems, but when you start trying to say what my dashboard should look like, then you really have to have a single source of the truth. So we find that the earlier the discussions happen, the better. So that's how to bridge it, but there's definitely a gap. Um, very few, we call them DevOps doers. Very few people are really highly skilled at both IT and OT, the, the specific technologies, I mean, the specific processes. Uh, if you have one, boy, hold on to them because they are, they are as precious as gold right now. Right. That's good to know. And on, on, the, on the using different labels point, um, mm -hmm. you talked about the, um, uh, a, a comment stroke question, really. There are three open group standards, OMI, um, uh, let's see, where are we? It's, it's moved up in the, uh, in the list now. Um, uh, we, we have some Internet of Things standards uh, inside the open group, OMI um, and ODEF being, ODEF in particular being about uh, getting the consistent labeling. Uh, ha have they been used or do you, are you aware of those? And if not, we can help you out. <laughs> At Intel, we spend a lot, I personally don't spend my time doing a lot with standards. Right. So I have colleagues who are deeply engaged. We have them deeply engaged with Open Group uh, in the Open Process Automation Forum, for example. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and in the emerging one around um, 
modeling in the in the uh, petroleum industry. But, yes. but so we believe heavily in standards. Open technologies, open source kinds of things can only work with standards. Uh, so, so we're a very strong proponent of that. It's sort of the unsung hero because, no offense, the standards take a long time to develop, and they're not really exciting or sexy, and so they don't get the attention that they should in many companies. Uh, and, and so when we talk to companies, we talk about that as sort of a, a, uh, um, a table stakes. If you don't have the standards, you're not going to have interoperability. Right. Right. Now, ODF was the one I, uh, that I omitted, but, well... One of the things that we're doing is we're trying to create standards quicker and make them sexier. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe we can fix <laughs> Good that. Luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can fix that. So um, next question: What's a reasonable time for failing fast? Oh boy. Um, well, <laughs> let me let me back up from that because what we've been told is that because many of these early smart projects, in particular, the last the ones who've been stood up in the last couple of years. They really were stood up by people who were really well-meaning, very enthusiastic, but the senior leadership tends to see those as being black holes, like the money pit. I have to keep throwing more and more money at it. And the reason that happens um, is because I, the technologist didn't adequately anticipate the infrastructure support needs. And so when you say, how long before I, I, stand, I, I, I claim defeat and say this didn't work? Um, very few projects will be scrapped 100%, but, but teams have to be ready to pivot. But the early teams, you saw a lot more pro smart projects just being scrapped because they couldn't make it work. They couldn't make it work within their system. They couldn't make it talk to other things. It became a terrible sink of subject matter expert time. We're seeing less of that as companies get better at deploying smart projects, we see more pivots and shifts than we see a uh, whole scale uh, throw it out. Right. So, uh, I mean, a related question, um, mm -hmm. is one of the origins of the problem um, the original project specifications and the scope of the work? Absolutely. Yeah. Almost, almost 100. That, or I've chosen a vendor that I'm really comfortable with because I've been working with them for decades, but that vendor may or may not have the, the specific expertise to stand this up. So I, I rely on a vendor uh, that I have a deep relationship with who might not be the right person, or I look, look for a, 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 I look for a piece of a solution from a vendor, but I haven't adequately thought about what other things that piece will have to be integrated with. You right. think of a box of Legos. If I just dump the box of Legos on your desk, I haven't really given you value. And so those are the two places we see a lot of companies struggling right now. So you, you talked um, about the importance of the relationship um, with, with vendor. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any guidelines for creating that type of, that type of relationship for these projects? We actually do have some very specific um, suggestions that that uh, technologist gave us about how to be a good partner, if I'm a manufacturer, or how to um, appear as a good partner for a manufacturer if I'm a vendor. And it almost always re relates to, uh, am I providing value? Am I describing value in, in, in concrete terms, not just in technical process terms? Uh, am I willing to work with you to help scope the project? Am I willing to uh, talk with you about some of the pitfalls? In fact, what we're finding from an Intel perspective, at least, is we spend so much of our time in an advisory capacity uh, rather than in a sales capacity uh, because it turns out that the advisory capacity is essential right now until companies get more comfortable. And then the other things technologists have told us is if, they, if your vendor can't show you something concrete, that don't be fooled by slideware. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Um, question. Uh, wonderful overview, lots of insights. Can you explain a couple of failures or situations where not meeting the desired results, um, where you didn't meet the desired results, and explain why it happened and how it was put back on track, where others 
<laughs> in a minute or less. Um, let me we, have, uh, we have a few. We have a few minutes actually, but but yes, it's uh, yeah. We've got about five minutes left. Right. So um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, of one that was a failure, and, and I'll talk a little bit about why that was a failure. And I'll, I'll refer to this large company again because we're getting to, we're working closely with this company, uh, not on a for fee basis. We're working to really understand what the digital digitization process really looks like from the inside of a company. So it's almost a piece of our research, like a deep dive case study. Right. And and I'll give an example since I didn't mention the company or the sector. I can do this. Um, they brought in a brand new piece of equipment that they work with a vendor who actually had deep process knowledge in their industry, not quite as much savvy around the IT end of things. They brought this in, and this piece of equipment, six months later, is still sitting off to the side, not integrated into their process, not plugged into the other data systems. And, and the main reason, the main reason why, and they're not sure they're ever going to get it up, by the way. And this is right. this is a company that's a big, this is a big, expensive piece of equipment. But but several things happened. Number one, they looked at the ROI with only that point solution of what where it was going to be plugged into their line. They didn't look at how that ROI was going to impact the rest of the line. So that's one. The second thing they didn't do is they really that data labeling problem became a really serious issue. So if I don't create one source of the truth, then my end user, my manufacturing staff, can't create really robust dashboards that are customized to their specific needs. And so they found out that even when I had this thing plugged in, I might be able to get some good data from it, but I really couldn't integrate that data into business insights. So, so, that, so, so how are they going about it now? They're actually taking a very long-term view of their equipment which, by the way, is going to be in service for probably 30 years minimum. Right. And they're saying, what do I need to do now? And how do I future-proof this in such a way that I'm always driving business value? So they've changed the conversation going forward. But I don't know if that one's ever, that one piece of equipment I just talked about, I don't know if it'll ever be fully integrated into their, into their planning. Right, right. You might be giving some clues about the sector with, that, with those as well. Um, uh, you described a number of blockers with technology like poor documentation. Would you say these problems are general to all IoT technologies or are some worse than others? Or put it put another way, are some technologies particularly problematic from this perspective? <laughs> yeah, I think I think at this point data center technologies are pretty well understood. We've been using data center, we've been using cloud kinds of technologies for quite a long time. Uh, relative to edge technologies, for example. Um, uh, certainly edge technologies, which are the hot thing right now, uh, don't have enough non-marketing, non-jargon kind of information around them. Uh, 5G communications technologies, you're going to see a real heat up between cloud service providers and telecom providers. Uh, I don't know that I don't know that manufacturers and technologists who need to consider these alternatives, I don't know that they have the language to actually ask the good questions or to understand the, the, the explanations that are given. So those are the those are the couple that I think are pretty problematic right now. Okay. And uh, we have time for uh, for one more question, I think. Um, let's see. There are so many. Um, uh, <laughs> Let's, I'm happy to answer offline too if you want okay, to. Okay, that, that, that would be very helpful if you can. Sure. Um, okay, uh, you mentioned the importance of tribes. Do you see value mm -hmm. in formalizing these in organizational structures like in the Spotify model? No. Right. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a great short it's answer. I don't, it's because as soon as you formalize them, you create a who belongs and who does not. And that assumes you know what that smart project or set of projects are going to need over time and that you've anticipated them all up front. What we're finding is that's just not a very good model, that these really require um, learning across functions, uh, learning across expertise levels and expertise domains. Um, the, the big company that we're working with actually called theirs the trailer tribe. They had a trailer on site that these people worked in and learned from each other, including consultants they brought in. 
And, and so we, we think these tribes tend to um, evolve over time as the projects themselves evolve. Right, right. That's a great way to end. Irene, really appreciate your, uh, your you insights so and, uh, and sharing your experience. And uh, imagine a big round of applause coming your way from, uh, from the <laughs> attendees. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. You so much. I appreciate it.